Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to you. You're watching another episode of Encounter. We have a very special guest with us today. We have Swami Bhakti Kamal Tyagi with us in the studio. Should I say Hare Krishna? Yes, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much for coming in the studio of, uh, of the NBC. And um, is it, you're from uh, California, the US? Yes, originally I'm from California. And uh, is it your first time in Mauritius? It's my fourth time. Fourth time. So when did you come before? I came last year and I came in, I think it was 2013 and 14. So you do come regularly to Mauritius. You're quite familiar with, with the country now. It's a gorgeous place. It's oh, one of the jewels of the earth. Thank you very much. <laughs> but um, I mean, having a look how you are, how you dressed, it must be quite a massive change from coming from California, the U.S., from the lifestyle to the life of, you're a monk, and uh, you preach a lot about bhakti yoga. You even have bhakti in your name. My first question to you would be, what is a monk? So the order of monks that I'm a part of is, is called Tridandi Sanyas. So classically, the word danda means it literally stick and specifically discipline. Which can is, gather sounds, the figurative sounds very representation. Hard. Yes. So tree danda means the triple danda or the three-part discipline. So that refers to the body, the mind, and speech. So a monk then is someone who lives a life of discipline of their body, their mind, and their speech. And specifically in the line of bhakti yoga, then that discipline means dedicating our speech, our mind, and our body to the to in engagement in bhakti, engagement in devotion to Krishna. So uh, you also preach bhakti yoga. Can you define bhakti yoga for those who do not understand? Sure. Um, well, we're a part of what's called the Rupanuga Sampradaya. So about 500 years ago, the original seminal acharya who defined our system of practice, his name was Srila Rupa Gosami. And he wrote a treatise called the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. And there, in the beginning of the text, he gives his definition of bhakti, where he says, Anya bilashita shunyam, jnana karma dhyanabritam, anukulyena krishnanushilanam bhakti ruttama. Which means that pure bhakti is constant engagement in service to Krishna to please Krishna, and which is not tinged by any sort of trifling, fleeting, or selfish desire, which is not based on any pursuit of a pleasurable or heavenly afterlife and which is not tinged by any pursuit of liberation from samsara or repeated birth and death. And then more practically speaking, he cites a definition which says Rishikena Rishikena Sevanam Bhakti Ruchite that bhakti means to serve the Lord of the senses with our senses. In other words, to use our hands, our mind, our body, our faculties to render service to Krishna, who is the master of our perception, who is the master of this world. And the two quotes that you have just mentioned, how mm -hmm. does it apply to the modern world nowadays? It applies to the modern world, it applies to the ancient world, it applies to life itself. Can you give us a few examples and uh, sure. explain a bit? So, we all have a body, we all have a mind, we all have senses, we all have these faculties with which we're moving in this environment we call the earth. And the core point is, in whose interest do we live? In, for whose satisfaction do we act? For ourself alone? Right? So the premise of theistic culture is that we, we live for God, not for ourself. And specifically in the culture of bhakti, we live not only for God, but to serve and satisfy God out of love for Him. So that means that we practically dedicate all the activities that we do to the satisfaction of Krishna. Now that doesn't mean we all have to become monks, we should go live in temples and give up our jobs or give up our families. It means that whatever we're doing, we do that in the spirit of devotion. We do that as an offering to Krishna. And additionally, we spend some part of our day to engage in some specific devotional practices like kirtan, like hearing the scripture, like offerings of worship. You mentioned uh, that everything that you do is in the name of uh, Krishna and uh, you can still have a normal life, have a job, and still do it, do, uh, practice your devotion to Krishna on the side. But you, on the other hand, you, you do it on a full-time basis. So please tell us more about it. 
Well, the scriptures say that there are different ashrams or shelters in which you can practice bhakti. So one is called the Grihast Ashram, where you can live as a householder with your family. But not that bhakti is a hobby or a part of your life, but actually your entire life is bhakti. But you practice bhakti through all the features of your life. So you take care of your children, you work your job, but everything is done in the spirit of an offering. But others, they prefer to be fully and exclusively engaged in devotional practices, so they may take up the lifestyle of a monk. And personally, I felt very comfortable and very happy in that lifestyle, so I've stuck with that. And how many years have you been at it? Um, I've been full-time in an ashram for about 13 years now. Uh, do you live in India? Um, I did live in India for about five years, and now I spend a little time in India each year and the rest of the year in other parts of the world at ashrams and other spiritual facilities. So you go around traveling around the world. So you're a citizen of the world now. Uh, yeah, you could say that. <laughs> um, Swami Bhakti, you're also a publisher and a lecturer. So uh, you pub you're a publisher, so you've written a few books? Um, yes, mainly I'm a translator. So I've taken some of the works of the previous acharyas in our lineage and translated them into English and presented them uh, in book form. And also I've compiled some books based on the lectures of also some of our gurus, compiled many talks together from transcriptions and then published them in an organized format. Does that mean that you have uh, a perfect understanding of Hindi, Sanskrit? Um, well, perfect is a very high standard. <laughs> I can say that I have a little understanding of Bengali and Sanskrit and with that I'm able to present some literature. You've come to Mauritius this time, especially around the Mahashivatri period. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason for this? Well, Mahashivratri is the most grand festival of the year in Mauritius, so it's certainly a joy to be a part of that. And it's a time when everyone takes some break from their conventional activities to immerse themselves in some spiritual act. So it's a nice time to come and speak to people about spiritual things. What are the talks that you normally do when you're in Mauritius? Is there a specific theme that you, you, you preach? Um, well, we, we talk about the, the line of devotion that we practice. So that's called Uttama Bhakti or pure Bhakti. And there are all the ways that that influences our lifestyle or all the aspects of practicing that. Then so many topics are there under that umbrella. But the overall idea is that we want to learn how to practice Bhakti without any selfish motivation, without any worldly interest, but just purely and selflessly, how we can live a life of selflessness and self-giving, and how that actually makes us happy, rather than whether it's religion or whether it's material activity, both based on this, I want to acquire, I want to control, I want to achieve a, a particular fixed end that I define. So nowadays we live in this consumer culture where everything is being driven by external validation and external right. achievements. So that is giving people this hollow sense of satisfaction, which is actually leaving them internally very dissatisfied and unstable. So everywhere there is this necessity to bring people's focus back to not living to achieve success in the eyes of others or meet a socially defined standard of success, but live by ideals and find satisfaction by sacrifice, by self-giving and by aspiration for a pure lifestyle in devotion. I will come back uh, to the sacrifice and devotion part in a few minutes. Earlier, you mentioned that uh, you're in Mauritius for Mahashivatri. Uh, I don't know if I may ask you this, but uh, you, you said that uh, in the devotion to Krishna, but Mahashivatri is to Shiva. So um, do they mix together? Indeed, they do. And to understand that, we have to look to the Shastra. We have to look to the actual texts that explain these things. The popular level understandings or the ideas promoted by various groups and institutions will not give us the harmony of this. We have to look in the Shastra. And there we find that in particular the text Srimad Bhagavatam, it is explained there that Vaishnavanam yatha shambhu, that of all Vaishnavas, Shiva is the greatest. What is a Vaishnava? A Vaishnava means one who is subservient to Vishnu, a servant of Vishnu. 
So Shiva, he is Mahadev, he is Devadi Dev, he is yeah. the greatest of the Devas, and he is also considered the greatest servitor of Vishnu. All right. But at the same time, it is found in the scriptures instances where Vishnu, he also worships Shiva. He also shows great honor to Shiva. So they have a very developed and subtle, intimate relationship. And so for us as Vaishnavas, and specifically Gaudiya Vaishnavas, we consider Shiva to be highly worshipable. And it's actually considered condemnable in our scriptures to disrespect or to belittle any of the devatas other than Krishna or their followers. However, it is understood that when we worship any of these devas, the real thing to be attentive to is the ideal, the intent of the worship. And many people are accustomed to the worship of devas for some personal benefits in their life. Yes. They want good health, they want protection from their family, Wealth, they want... Wealth, knowledge, you name it. Yes, exactly. And so, the, you could say the, the contrast that we're coming with is not that it's wrong to worship the various devas, but that actually engaging in worship with those intentions will not actually really satisfy you. And that the culture of what we call pure bhakti, or bhakti that's not based on some desired reward, but based on bhakti as the goal and bhakti as the process, just a life of devotion for itself, that that is actually what is really fulfilling and beautiful and the real message of all the revealed scriptures. And that Lord Shiva, he has that. He has that type of pure bhakti. And if we really understand him, we really honor him, he'll bless us with that. So it all starts from the intention. Exactly. I'm not very familiar with the bhakti yoga. What are the golden rules? Or let's say, what would be the first thing you would tell me if I want to start discovering bhakti yoga? Mm -hmm. um, well, the essential things in the path of bhakti are to accept a guru, and then according to the guidance of the guru, to engage in the primary practices. And then after that, to take up the practices yeah. that are taught by the guru. And nowadays, the practices of bhakti are very widely known. Kirtan has become an international popular music genre. Yeah. But especially in a place like the United States, or people who are now, you could say, appropriating the practice of kirtan and using it for the various style or desires or ways that they want within their culture. But this is the point that we have to be careful about, is that the practices of bhakti are not there for us to, to do and use according to our views, but we have to practice them as they've been taught, as, as the means to reach the goal that they're actually intended for. So it's to keep the essence pure, exactly. to reach where you want to. Classically in Hinduism, there are these four ends of life, the Chatur Varga, Dharma, Artha, Kama, and Moksha. So most people consider that moksha will be the highest or final attainment. But what the Gaudiya Vaishnavas teach on the basis of Srimad Bhagavatam is that there is a fifth end. The four are not complete. There is a fifth end, which they define as prema or prema bhakti. Love. Which means love, but specifically love, in a, love that is purely selfless and dedicated to the Lord. Unconditional love? You could say that, but All right. not only unconditional love, but unconditional love in connection with the supreme being, the supreme original personal source of the whole of existence, who but we it, call Svayam Bhagavan. But it's normally believed that uh, you adopt unconditional love at the start, not after. So how do you find, how do you well, balance it? But we, it should be all the way, right? Well, for us, the understanding is that we have so much conditioning, what are called sangskaras, yes. vasanas in our yes. mind. Yes. And because of all that conditioning, in our present state, unconditional love is impossible. Or very hard to attain. So the practice of bhakti is what can purify all those sangskaras and draw in this higher grace and this higher connection that will make that expression of unconditional love possible. Let's say I come up to you and say, uh, would you please be my guru and introduce me to bhakti yoga? What would be the first thing you would tell me? First thing I would tell you is that I'm not qualified to be your guru. <laughs> <laughs> but I can at least share with you some of the teachings of my guru and give you direction where you can find a sadguru. Please share the teachings. I'm sure the, the viewers <laughs> would be very interested in knowing. Well, in a nutshell, they're represented as three essential tenets, what are called sambandha, abhideya, and prayojana. 
So Prayojana mean, in short means the goal, Abhideya means the path to the goal, and Sambandha means understanding who we are and what is our relationship with everyone else around us. So if we have, you could say the beginning of everything is self-knowledge. If we don't know who we are, all of our equations about the priority and value of everything else are going to be skewed. So a text like the Bhagavad Gita begins precisely on this point. Who are you? And that, that point is made that the real self is not the physical body, nor is it the mind, but it is an eternal atma, an eternal conscious entity that has no beginning and will have no end and has passed through innumerable bodies. Yes. Just as every day we put on a set of clothes and the next day we put on another set of clothes and the next day another set of clothes, like that, the Atma has worn so many bodies. And when we can identify ourselves not as this body, then all of our priorities change. And rather than seeing life and success as acquiring attainments and achievements and security and power for the body and its interests in the physical world, but we can understand success means that finding what is of value in our eternal journey as an Atma. So then when we get that real self-knowledge, then we have to understand, well, how is it that I exist as an Atma? And that leads us to the point of the Paramatma, or that Supreme Atma that is enabling the existence of every other Atma. So then we have to say, well, who is that Paramatma? Is it just an energy? Is it a, a buzz? Or is it a person? Or what is that? So the, the Vedic scriptures are in great detail about all of those things. But the Srimad Bhagavatam gives a very, very, very valuable, essential summary about this. And it says this verse, Paranti tatvavidas tatvam yajgena madbhayam brameti paramatmeti bhagavaniti shabdhyate where it summarizes all the essential views about the nature of the absolute truth. And it says that those who know the reality, the real seers of truth, the ancient rishis and all enlightened beings, they may see or perceive the absolute reality in three primary ways. One as Brahman, or this all-encompassing, unqualified spiritual existence or reality. Second, as Paramatma, as this fundamental, animate, living entity that is giving rise to the life of every other living being and who is, is situated within everyone. So in other words, the absolute as all-encompassing and the absolute as all-pervading and present within everyone. And then the third point is Bhagavan, means God the person, who is not so big, not so small, but medium size. <laughs> Meaning a size that is in with, to whom we can relate as a person and with whom we can exchange love. So the bhakti path is all about having experience of the absolute in connection with Bhagavan, the person. Whereas many practices of yoga, various types of renunciation, tapasya, uh, types of what they call jnana, lead us to Brahm <coughs> Brahman realization, different types of yoga, different types of, uh, lead to types of samadhi, or realization of Paramatma in various forms. So it is said that that absolute reality will appear to us according to the way that we approach it. Of course, makes so, sense. So if we approach it in this way, we will see it that way. If we approach it this way, we will see it that way. It depends on your approach and also on the experience that you gain along the way. Exactly. And so I particularly follow the bhakti path, which leads to realization of Bhagavan, the, the personality of the absolute reality. And then, if we look closely in the scriptures, there are some great sages, great kings, great rishis who've had experience of multiple of these aspects. And that's where it gets interesting because they describe that after having had experience of Paramatma or after having had experience of Brahman, when I came to have experience of Bhagavan, it was another thing altogether. <laughs> in other words, it captivated me completely. And I felt like if the... The, the joy or the bliss or the fulfillment that I had in this, it hardly compares to a drop in the ocean of the bliss that is found in that. Wow, that's very deep. So in that sense, then the scriptures come to teach us that all these things are there for you, but those who are blessed and those who are wise, they will never reject this opportunity for eternal love with Krishna, for eternal love with the Supreme. What is your motivation for this passion to be a monk, to be a preacher of bhakti yoga? You could say it's just 
what we just described, having heard these ideals, then I came to feel this is the most valuable way of life. This is how we can make the best use of this human form of life. The scriptures tell us that the human form of life is the most desirable birth you can have. Because in this birth, you have a type of intelligence with which you can tune in to revelation. Yes. And other life forms don't have that same facility. So the purpose of human life is to achieve realization of higher spiritual nature. And yet, human life, as valuable as it is, is very temporary, and we don't know how long it will last. So the scriptures encourage us, use your human life to achieve the highest spiritual benefit you can. That's why it's there. It's not there to be a Hollywood a movie star, or a CEO of a tech company, or the president of a country, or whatever kind of worldly success people achieve. All of that will be inevitably lost in time, and most likely will entangle you in a lot of undesirable karma in the future. So use your human life for this higher spiritual attainment. So myself, as a teenager, when I was going to school and thinking about what am I going to do with my life, and I came to hear these spiritual teachings, I thought, that's what I want to do with my life. And so I did it. I completed my education, and then I just went right into full-time engagement in spiritual practice. And I'm still doing that today, and I feel very blessed and very happy to have made that choice. Well, you have found your life mission at a very early age, we can tell. Um, all you just explained, um, it's all said in the scriptures, but how has been the journey for you? I mean, I grew up, as I said, in California, and I was a, st a student there, and I was a seeker. You know, I first learned about Indian culture through Hatha Yoga. My mother invited me to try some Hatha Yoga classes, and then I heard the Om symbol and saw Sanskrit writing and heard about sadhus and these things, and I just naturally felt some attraction to that. And then in time, I found the text Bhagavad Gita. And that very much spoke to me. Why? I don't know. <laughs> but somehow when I read it, it spoke to me like no book I had ever found before. And that inspired me to try to find people who also practiced the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita. And then when I had that desire, I searched. And then I found some practitioners of bhakti. And little by little, I... And the more you seek, the more you find people coming on your way, helping you to Definitely. find... Us. Definitely. Well, those, what you seek is already seeking you. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I experienced that I as well. I just quoted it Rumi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, um, thank you very much uh, for being uh, with us. Uh, before we wrap up this, this episode, I just want to know, uh, you as a monk, how is your daily life? Uh, is there a time that you wake up, you do your practices, you sing. Just tell us a bit, uh, one day of your normal life. Okay, well, um, normal life would be when we're in a, a particular ashram or temple. So while we're there, then usually... Is there, is there a specific time that you wake up every day? Um, usually it depends on the schedule of that ashram that I'm in. So normally there's always some early morning prayers, some starting anywhere from 4.30 to 6 a.m., somewhere in that range they will yeah. start. Yeah depending on the place and the schedule of everything. So usually we'll wake up sometime before that. We'll always start with a bath, always start with some mantra and pur purification, a steadying of the mind. And then we'll engage in some worship and some chanting, kirtan, and some meditation, and also some class or discussion of some of the revealed scriptures. And that as a, as a package, so to speak, we call it a morning program, if you will. And we do that every day. And usually in the evening after sunset, we have another program. What is a program? Well, like bhajans? Uh, yeah, well, we have what's called arati. So there's some prayers, offerings prayer made to the deities yeah. while we chant certain kirtans. Then we'll recite some prayers. We'll also chant some other, uh, you could say bhajans or kirtans that both glorify the Lord and his various leelas, as well as express the various prayers that devotees have. And then we'll have either a class on a particular theme that's of use or to our community, or a recitation of some important teachings from the scripture. And so those activities we usually do morning and evening. And then during the day, as a person in the ashram, then we'll have some responsible duties in the ashram. So some persons might work in the garden, some persons might cook the lunch for everyone, some persons might work in the office. Myself, I do a lot of work with publishing, so I'm usually working on translation or secretarial work or things like that. And we receive guests and we try to, and people just randomly need help with things. So whatever comes, we just happily attend to that. One of the main things that, um, that has come across with people who travel a lot is very often 
they don't have enough time to sleep. <laughs> it's one of them. I wouldn't say it's an issue, but uh, do you get your seven hours of sleep every day? Um, or do you try to? <laughs> I try to. I mean, jet lag sometimes makes it difficult, and sometimes we have busy schedules. So sometimes I feel a bit behind on sufficient sleep. Um, but most of the time, it's all right. Swami Bhakti, thank you very much for being with us in the studio. Thank you for sharing your time and your knowledge with us. It has been a pleasure having you with us. Ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to the end of this episode of Encounter. I'm sure you must have enjoyed it. If you have any questions, queries, you have any topics that you want to suggest in the next uh, programs, drop an email at encounter at nbc.ifnet.mu. Until then, goodbye. Thank you.